in light of the momentous decisions of the Supreme Court in recent weeks, there's been a considerable discussion online about Christian patriotism and whether Christians can remain patriots within America or even if the concept of patriotism is appropriate for a Christian living, Christian life. Should we have an unbounded love of country and embrace of the American system and way of government? Or should we hold uh, that system with a certain measure of detachment, recognizing that our citizenship is truly in heaven and we are sojourners in this world? And so earthly kingdoms come and go and we shouldn't have any particular attachment to one particular nation or another. Get too involved in that would be perhaps even approaching uh, an idolatrous attachment to a nation. And so discussions have ranged back and forth and strategies have been proposed as to how Christians within uh, this new America, a new America which uh, has given itself over to uh, uh, the destruction of many of the standards that God has placed in His Word for us. Uh, in, in this new culture, in this new day, should we remain as Christian patriots and how should that patriotism be reflected? in the way that we live today. I suppose there will be many answers to that. My own conviction is that we may yet remain Christian patriots in our country today. We have much to be thankful for in our nation. Last night as I uh, heard the fireworks going off, I stepped outside my home, out in the street where families were gathered and up in the sky all around me from different directions. Fireworks were going off in the sky. Boom, 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 boom. And then the big Boom! <laughs> going off and lights flashing all over the place. And it was wonderful. Many times when I've seen that in the past or have heard that in the past, I'm up in my study, my dogs are getting upset, and, and I can't concentrate on my sermon preparation. But this day, I was able to celebrate and rejoice in our country. Not because of decisions that have been made, but because of what our country once was and may yet become again. We have a tremendous history that we should celebrate and rejoice in. I think there's good reason for us to be patriots. But patriots to have a realistic view of the nation itself and a, a, a determination to relate to our country based on God's word, God's standards, and to present the gospel of Christ to our nation so that we might return to a more godly walk more God-fearing way. As much as we bemoan the corruption that has developed over the course of recent years and especially over the past few weeks in our nation's history, I don't think that we've yet come to the point where we can compare ourselves with what Daniel had to experience long ago. When he was taken as a young boy captive into Babylon and in exile from Jerusalem, one of the uh, large retinue of young scholars and, and the, the elite of Judea taken to Babylon and brought into the court of Nebuchadnezzar, trained in all of the lore and history of Babylon, raised to be a servant in the king's court. This Daniel would set himself apart from the rest of uh, the king's servants, uh, along with Shadrach, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar in Abednego, I've got to get those names straight. And he set himself apart by his faithfulness to his God, even yet re being removed to Babylon, which was in service of paganism. God's uh, Marduk and, and Bel and others. Daniel committed himself to faithfully serving the Lord, even to such an extent that though it, it annoyed others, they tried to trip him up in his faith by having a, a, a ruling made that if anyone makes a petition to any god besides the king for a certain period of time, he would be in danger of, of death. Well, what did Daniel do? But he opened up the windows of his home, and as usual, in full view of everyone, he prayed to the east, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to his god, the one true god, the heavens and the earth. God saved him, spared him of judgment. This Daniel had to face many challenges over the course of his life. 
but we approach a time in his life when he's about 81 years of age now, and he's largely forgotten. Belshazzar, the king, or at least the one who's in charge there in, in Babylon, uh, has no idea of who this Daniel is. Belshazzar and his lords and ladies and, and all of his retinue are there in the, the capital of the palace, and he is hosting a great feast. And this was an unusual situation for the Chaldean kings to sit down for the king and to eat in front of everybody else. They maintained a kind of discreet distance from their lords and so forth by eating separately from them. You might recall Joseph uh, long ago in Egypt doing a similar thing with the, the Egyptians and the, the Israelis. There's this separation of ordinarily, but now he sits with them and they have a feast, a great feast. And Daniel records that he's there with his queens and with his concubines and the lords of the realm all gathered together. What you might not be immediately aware of is that outside the city is the Medo-Persian army encircling around the city and holding siege to the city. Now the Babylonians were so confident in their siege works and the, their supply of food that they can outlast any siege that was be set up outside them. And so to kind of dramatize that, Belshazzar has this great feast there in his palace. And they serve the great wines of the day before the people, boasting about their security. What becomes most offensive, however, at this particular feast is that Belshazzar remembers that the uh, temple utensils from Jerusalem were there in Babylon. They were stored by King Nebuchadnezzar in the palace. And now, apparently for the first time, Belshazzar, wishing to demean the Jewish God, the true God, the one who stood opposed to him, he brought out all of these vessels and so forth and distributed them to his uh, lords and ladies and they all drank wine from the temple cups. This was an affront to the Jewish faith, to the worship of Yahweh. And it was in many respects such an arrogant act whereby Belshazzar uh, treats the true God with great disrespect, and then in his very presence, rejoices in and praises the gods of the Babylonians, whom Daniel describes as, as almost in materialistic, humanistic terms, gods of gold and silver, wood, and, and so forth. Daniel in his account recognizes that all these gods are nothing more than the wood and stone that are standing there before them. There's nothing to them. But Belshazzar and all of his company worship these things which are lifeless things and reject the true God. It reminds us of what we considered last week in Romans chapter 1 where Paul speaks of this great exchange that mankind has made from the true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and God's made in the image of men and animals and creeping things and birds of the sky. Rather than serving the true God, Mankind would rather serve all these empty things, worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And we saw that today as there's a great movement towards androgyny and to homosexual marriage and all these kinds of things, underlying them is the same nature of worship, the same pagan spirituality that continues to reveal itself in the Hinduism and the yogas and all these kinds of things that are uh, emanating in, in businesses and government circles and so forth. This pagan spirituality that is with us today once more is the sort of thing that Daniel faced full on. And Daniel looked at them and said, there's nothing more to them but the gold and silver and the iron and so forth that they're made of. That's all. There's one true God in the heavens who is a sovereign. And the point of this chapter and the previous chapter will be to reinforce this notion 
that there is only one God, one true God, who is the ruler over the heavens and the earth, who raises up kingdoms and sets kings over them and also brings them down. We read a moment ago of how Daniel comes, is called into the presence of Belshazzar to answer some questions. And Daniel repeats something of that great history of Babylon, a pagan nation. Now, mind you, the Lord God of Israel was the Lord God who had control over the pagan nations of the earth. And his laws were over these pagan nations. They were accountable to the true God. And their arrogance, their pride, would be judged by God. And so when Nebuchadnezzar, who had been given authority to rule in Babylon, well far away from Israel, given authority to rule there, God raised him up to that position. God gave him, gave him the authority to rule and to do all the many things that he did. He had amazing powers, putting some to death, letting others live, uh, prospering one person on one hand and, and despoiling another. He was a tyrant. He was a king. And his will was law to an extent. When he looked over his kingdom and in pride magnified himself, all that had been accomplished, Daniel reminded his grandson, Belshazzar, that God himself intervened and humbled Nebuchadnezzar took away his sanity for a period of seven years, had him wander out in the wilderness like an animal, and so humbled him until he finally came to the point of recognizing that there's one true God, and we are subject to him. And at that time, God restored his sanity, he restored his dominion, and he ruled thereafter. And Daniel speaks to Belshazzar. You remember the, the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave to Daniel at the very beginning? Belshazzar. It's pretty much the same name. So it's Belshazzar speaking to Belshazzar. A pagan king and a godly civil servant. And Daniel says to him, that you, Belshazzar, should have learned from your history and from your family. You should have paid attention to what God had done in history and in time to humble your grandfather, who is described in short as his father, to humble your father. You should have taken note of that. Instead, in your arrogance, you set yourself up. In your arrogance, you brought in all of the uh, temple uh, wine cups and so forth, and you had this great feast, and no doubt it was a pagan feast with considerable immorality. The concubines there were not just simply there for honored guests to observe a meal. And so here in this pagan situation where pagan spirituality rules the day, where sexual immorality is rampant, Daniel comes in and speaks to him. He says, this is why you saw something. What did Belshazzar see? Well, on the wall, a hand appeared, illumined by a lampstand. I don't know if that lampstand was from the, the temple of the Lord, or whether it's just one of the lampstands there in the, the palace. But he illumined this hand up against the wall. And all he see that was this hand beginning to write out, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. A disembodied hand. And when Belshazzar and all his guests see this hand writing on the wall, their knees begin to knock, the color is taken out of their faces, they are frightened terribly by this supernatural appearance. What does this mean? They bring in the enchanters, they bring in all of the uh, uh, pagan uh, magicians, and they try to interpret the meaning of this handwriting on the wall. It was inscribed on the wall so that when the hand left, the writing was there for all to see. 
Now while there's a lot of wine there, and probably a fair bit of drunkenness, nonetheless this was no hallucination, this was clearly written on the wall, and multiples of people who are not a part of that feast would come and take a look at it and try to determine what this, this inscription meant. It was a sign of God's judgment in multiple ways. One, it was a revelation given by God to Belshazzar, but Belshazzar didn't understand what was being said, nor did his pagan spiritualists understand what was being said. It went beyond all of their wisdom and all of their learning. And so God, in this way, humbled them and forced them to turn to God's uh, prophet, Daniel, that ancient civil servant who had served with distinction in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, but in recent years have been all but forgotten. God used this to humble their hearts and point them to Daniel so that he might give an inspired interpretation for what these four words meant. Three words, one duplicated twice, repeated twice for emphasis. And so Daniel is called upon to give the interpretation. And what a powerful message it is. It's a message that should sound forth to all pagan tyrants who would raise themselves and elevate themselves up in their nations. And they need to be reminded that there is a king in heaven who rules over all, to whom they must give an account. Mene, the first word, repeated twice to emphasize uh, its importance. It means numbered. So numbered, numbered. And Daniel gives the interpretation of that by saying your days have been numbered. Your kingdom is coming to an end. And so Belshazzar and all his guests there in this palace are celebrating their security and laughing at the the armies of the, the, the Persians are outside their gates and thinking that nothing can happen to them. God says to him, your days are numbered. God reminds each of us that there's a certain span of life given to us. For some, maybe 70, 80 years, maybe more, others much less. But our days are numbered and they're in the sovereign hands of God over all. Are you prepared to give an account for those days? The next, next word, tekel, means judge. And, or excuse me, weigh. means to weigh. And Daniel interprets it by saying that you have been weighed in the balances and have found wanting. In other words, Belshazzar, you're the king of Babylon, the king of the, the ruler of the world. But in God's sight, there's no substance to you. There's nothing of worth or value to you. You are empty. And so in his pride and in his foolishness, he vaunted himself up as though he was something special. But God says, you're nothing. You're empty. And so you've been weighed in the balances. And in terms of what God expects of righteousness in the heart of the king and in the life of the king, Belshazzar had nothing to show. He was empty. Are you prepared to be judged by the Lord? And how will your life weigh out? Some think that at the end of days, God will judge us on a scale, and if our good works that way are bad, then we'll get into heaven. Otherwise not. That's not the scale that God uses. The scale that God uses is not your good works versus your bad works, but your works versus the righteousness of Christ. And your works will always fall far short. You must rest in Christ and have His righteousness communicated to you so that you might have substance and be acceptable to God. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Persians. So this vast kingdom of which Belshazzar rules over and 
thinks so highly of, that will be divided from him, taken away, and given over to the armies encircling his city. He thinks that his city walls are sufficient to withhold any siege. He has sufficient supplies to last him for a century or more. Why worry about what's outside the walls? Little does he know that I believe it's uh, Darius and his kings have diverted the, the, the um, I believe the Euphrates River away from its normal course into a side bed so that the waters coming to the city of Babylon would begin to go down. The city of Babylon was built over the waters and around it. And the gates went over those waters, but they go all the way down. And what would happen is that those waters would recede to the point that the Persian soldiers would begin at night to slip under the gates there, under the walls, and come into the city with nothing stopping them. And as Daniel said to Belshazzar, this night you will perish. And so it was. Excuse me. That your kingdom will be divided and taken away from you. And, and that very night he was killed. God's judgments on men and nations are profound. Look at what happens here. There's not an offer of repentance. There's not a call to repentance given here. There's simply the announcing of judgment because we are beyond the point of a call to repentance. The scriptures tell us that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you should receive the gospel and rest in Christ. But if you harden your heart and go off on to your, in your sins, day after day, year after year, there will come a time when there will be no further offer of forgiveness. There will be simply the announcing of judgment. And there will be no turning back. Your fate will be set. Listen to God's word and heed its warnings and repent now while the day is at hand. Turn to Christ for salvation and life. Don't resist Him. Well, this is a, an amazing story of a civil servant serving in a pagan society who served God with faithfulness and integrity, doing a number of things in that society. One, he argued that there's one true God and steadfastly held to that position. In contrast to those who said, no, no, there are plenty of gods, or a variety of gods, or gods of all kinds of forces of nature and trees and so forth, and these are the things we should be worshiping. Daniel said, no, there's one true God. And we, if we wish to be faithful in our country today, need to hold forth this message that there's one true God, only one, and the gods of the nations are as nothing before him. And we must not bow down to those gods, but must serve the true God and him alone. Second, this true God judges all mankind faithfully in accord with his law. And we are obligated to serve this God. And so at one point or another, his laws will come into effect and we will be held accountable. We may go through many years and not see any judgment. But judgment is coming surely and finally at some point. And in the end, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Finally, the hand that wrote these words on the wall, the hand that inscribed the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, is the hand that was extended to us at the cross, that we might have our sins forgiven. The handwriting which composed our sins was nailed to the cross in Christ, and he bore our sins on the tree so that we might be delivered. Rest in this Jesus, into whose hands now all authority in heaven and earth is given. And follow after him, trusting that you are in his hands. 
in His hands and in the hands of the Father. And no one can separate you from those powerful hands. The one who writes the course of history is the one who secures your faith and keeps you to that eternal day. Trust in Him. It's great. Father, we pray that as we have meditated on your word this day, that your spirit would bless us, that we would be strong in faith and faithful in service in our world today. Help us to be willing to suffer the loss of all things in this life. Help us to be willing to live in obscurity, uh, but faithfully before you, that we might in good time uh, be prepared to serve you in whichever way you call each of us. We pray for your blessing on us in Jesus' name.